This is um, a fantastic occasion because we have a leading authority on 20th century um, British um, design and architecture with us today, um, Alan Powers, who's written extensively about British printmaking and um, in particular the Kerwin Press. And we're, one, we're really pleased to be able to also have with us Stanley Jones, who is one of the founding artist printers of the Kerwin Studio. And this is particularly um, great for us because Stanley worked with Henry Moore, Elizabeth Brink, Kerry Richards, but also with Barbara Hepworth. And recently, with Stanley's help, um, we were able to acquire the final print um, to enable us to complete our holdings of Barbara Hepworth's graphic works, some of which you will see upstairs in our current exhibition, Sculpting the Line, curated by my colleague, assistant curator Holly Grange. And again, if you haven't been to see that yet, please go upstairs because you will see some of the prints which Alan and Stanley are going to talk about today. So um, enjoy this talk. There'll be time for questions, I think. I'm Alan, uh, and I uh, did this book which came out in 2008, which was 50 years after Stanley uh, first opened the Kerwin studio. Uh, so even more time has elapsed since then. Uh, it was also 100 years after uh, Harold Kerwin, the, of the third generation, joined this family printing company in East London. And I think this whole... Kerwin thing uh, deserves a bit of explaining because it's a very interesting example of a certain sort of mentality uh, coming down through a, a time span of over 150 years now. Um, uh, the Kerwins are, a, I think, a Westmoreland family in origin. Uh, one of them in the Victorian period became a Congregationalist minister, the Reverend John Kerwin, and uh, he moved around, as ministers do. At one point, uh, he was in Suffolk. Um, and he met uh, a lady in Norwich who had invented um, a method for uh, notating music that was easier to read than uh, the ordinary musical stave and also easier to print. Uh, it was called the tonic sulfar, and it's basically, like in Sound of Music, it's do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. Uh, and um, John Kerwin saw the potential of this for encouraging community singing uh, as a part of worship. Uh, so he uh, took it on board, started writing instruction manuals how to use it, and, uh, and he got them printed, and then he thought, well, I'll, I'll have my own printing press, and we'll cut out the middleman. So, um, rather unusually for a, a minister, um, he actually turned his chapel into a, 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 a printing factory uh, and got a new chapel. Um, so, that was why the Kerwin Press was in Plaster, because that was where the Reverend John Kerwin happened to be at the time. Um, and... The business thrived. They also had a magazine, and so he passed it on to his sons. They kept it going, and then 1908, uh, the next generation, Harold um, Kerwin, who, you know, in this typical uh, sort of generational Victorian story, he's the one who's given a rather kind of liberal alternative education at a school called Abbotsholm, um, and uh, comes full of idealism and wishing to sort of expand the horizons of this business. Um, so it took him a little while to get this going and it really sort of gelled at the end of the First World War. And this was one of the fa famous examples of, um, it, it works very well both as text and image, sort of explaining what this is all about. Um, you can see there's a bit of the missionary still there. Um, but the missionary has totally elided with the business of the printer, that it's through the printing that the world will be made better and more cheerful. Um, and in 1920, it certainly needed it. Um, and uh, it's perhaps a little bit naive, but uh, it's a portent of, of what was to come. Um, 
it's an advertisement aimed at commercial customers that they could have their printing done better and that will be good for business. So there's, there's a kind of sound business sense behind this adoption of art and design. Uh, it's a period in the 1920s when there's a small cohort of very motivated industrialists um, who got together in the Design and Industries Association uh, in order, in their separate ways, to uh, <coughs> encourage the idea that design is a social mission um, that will improve the quality of life, um, create a sort of cohesion, uh, and the sort of thing that no, nobody, not even William Morris, had quite sort of got the hang of this before, because this is using machinery, using the tools of the Industrial Revolution to overcome uh, all the disadvantages that had come in its wake. Uh, one of the sort of side projects of the Kerwin Press, um, based on uh, an idea from the artist Claude Lovett Fraser, who, whose work we were looking at there, um, he actually died in 1921, very young, but uh, he'd done a, a huge amount of work in a short time, uh, having come out of the army. Uh, and he had a notebook covered in Italian decorative paper. He said, why not, you know, produce paper like this. This is one of Lovett Fraser's designs. And uh, his friend Paul Nash, well-known <coughs> artist of the period, sort of took this up and persuaded Kerwin and introduced them to young artists who uh, would make these uh, decorative repeat patterns essentially abstract. Uh, so this is a, a book that Nash put together showing these. So it's, it's a mixture of you know, doing it for the hell of it, for the fun of it, uh, and hoping to make some money along the way. Uh, in this case, they used to run these through the press when they had a bit of downtime. They'd, they'd run a few more pattern papers just to kind of keep the thing going. Uh, and that went on. And it, it helped to kind of spread the mission. You could look these up in the Dryad Handicrafts catalogue and, you know, order a selection of them uh, for your bookbinding class. Uh, this is a sample of the commercial work where, again, uh, very young artists, um, Edward Borden uh, would have been about 28 years old, and in fact he'd already been working for the Kerwin Press for five years at this point, so he was snatched right out of college um, by Paul Nash, um, who showed his work to the Kerwins, and by that stage, uh, an, um, another important figure, Oliver Simon, who joined the company because he uh, was desperate to be involved in printing in some way or another. He came on his mother's side from the Rothenstein family in Bradford, um, which was very significant in uh, the arts of that period, particularly his uncle William, who was the principal of the Royal College of Art, where there were a lot of artists who were kind of pulled into the Kerwin thing. So... I mean, this actually was chosen as, as the cover of, of my book, um, and it's fantastically undated, I think. It just still works. It's funny, it's charming, it's informative. Uh, you know, you want to look at it. So um, uh, that's Edward Borden, whose history carries on. Stanley might talk about that. They did work for London Transport. They were one among a number of London... Uh, printing works who did interesting high quality work that was, they were prepared to engage with uh, modern artists. Uh, Paul Nash doing a cover for a brochure for Bryant and May. Um, very extravagant sort of brand building but Kerwin functioned almost like an advertising agency. Bryant and May probably came through somebody else but somebody would have said oh well just send it to Kerwin, they'll do you a nice job. And, uh, so it has rather futuristic double exposure photographs inside by an avant-garde photographer, a Paul Nash cover that back in the um, early 30s wouldn't have been everybody's fancy, I don't think, but uh, they, they were sort of experimental times. Edward Borden started making these wallpapers primarily for his own amusement, and, and Kerwin said, oh, you know, let's give those a go. So they, they printed them in sheets rather than rolls, and uh, not many people bought them. Um, but again, you know, it was part of the, the sort of sense of generosity um, and wanting to make a difference. Uh, this is Edward Borden again, um, 
And this, the Kerwin Press Miscellany, uh, 1931, is, is a kind of very luxurious um, giveaway to your customers or your would-be customers. You sort of have lunch with them or whatever and say, oh, perhaps you'd like a copy of this book, which is, is absolutely fabulous and now an incredibly rare and expensive item, which sort of says these are the typefaces, this is the kind of work we do, these are the artists we can commission for you. And this uh, particular one is hand-stenciled in colour, uh, which was something they went in for. They had a workshop of um, young women uh, who became very skilled in um, what in fr fr France is called pochoir, um, and so they'd adopted that on, uh, rather on Paul Nash's suggestion. Uh, they gave it up in the 1930s Depression, uh, so this is one of the last ones. But again, Borden, you know, it's, it's wonderfully sort of mad and silly uh, and fun. So it is the spirit of joy. Borden, again, his lino-cutting technique uh, transferred into lithography. Lithography I'll come to in a moment. We've got a lot to get through. Eric Revilius was another artist who... Uh, contributed a lot from the same Royal College cohort. And I've got here an original of the Kerwin Press newsletter with a Revilius cover, hand-stencil hand colouring. And uh, interestingly, this one, this is another sort of extravagant giveaway. It says price <coughs> two shillings on it, which um, was not a huge lot for what you were getting. And here, a, a chart of the colours that they offered. Uh, and this, I think, is interesting that um, it's a technical thing in a way, but it's also part of this clearing away of the, the kind of uh, greyness and colourlessness of life uh, with bright, strong colours. And it, it explains on them that these are, these are permanent, they're not going to fade, uh, uh, as if other people would give you flashy colours, but they wouldn't last. So uh, a general sense that, that we do quality regardless of other considerations, you're going to get the best from us. Uh, Revilius was uh, allowed to start this project, which became a, a, a book, a sort of children's book called High Street. And he worked on it for about two years before anybody actually asked for any money. Uh, it was artist-led, quite interestingly. There was no publisher, no, no author, and no text. And he just started doing these uh, prints. Um, and the whole thing came together, finally, as a book. Uh, so it was a, a quite substantial act of patronage that was going on, which also, I think, extended to this project for producing um, a set of prints aimed at schools with the idea that they should have original works of art on the walls in the school. Uh, and they did two series amounting to a dozen or so prints altogether. Uh, this one by Paul Nash. Um, and um, this one, rather surprisingly, by Graham Sutherland. Uh, something that Stanley says he was rather embarrassed about in, in later life. Uh, but these are uh, quite big, sort of poster size uh, sheets, printed as lithographs. And this is why I need to explain very briefly what's significant about that. Uh, there are uh, three basic, no, four basic printmaking media. And they kind of go in historical sequence, although each one continues as the other ones are, are introduced. So relief printing, uh, wood cutting, lino cutting, etc., is the, the first in line. Then um, intaglio, which includes etching and other things done usually on metal plates and printed in a different kind of press, like a mangle, where you leave the, the ink uh, under the surface of the plate in the lines and you get a, a more subtle print than you can get from a relief um, surface. And intaglio uh, holds the field for artists uh, until uh, 1793, I think it is, or was it 98, uh, when accidentally in Bavaria, Alois Senefelder invented lithography uh, by mistake. He was writing a laundry list on a piece of stone. Uh, and because he was a printer, he tried to etch the stone and ended up inventing lithography. And the difference about that is that uh, it's not to do with the physical depth of the plate like the other two. Uh, this is a chemical reaction. If you 
work on your surface and stone, this particular stone is suitable because it, it's slightly absorbent. Um, and then uh, you, in the process of printing, you, you wet the stone. The image that you've drawn um, doesn't get wet. And if you run an oil-based ink over it, the ink will not um, stick where the water's been, uh, only on the bits where you've drawn. Um, it's also known as pl planographic printing. Uh, and this has the benefit over intaglio that it can be faster to, to run the prints. You don't have to ink and wipe every time. Um, and also you've got a much wider range of the kinds of marks you can make. You can draw with a nib, you can draw with a crayon, you can paint with a brush, you can dilute ink and make a wash. So it's getting a lot closer to painting, and it's, as it were, the sort of archetypal medium for the Romantic movement, because it's personal, direct, more dramatic. Um, and so lithography began to move in from the margins, but as far as things like book printing were concerned, uh, relief printing um, held on, uh, partly because of the business of making up words and so on, and partly because of, sort of, of a sort of conservatism in the printing trades. That's what people were used to doing, so that's what they went on doing. And that was still going on um, really almost into the 1980s. There was still this distinction between printing with metal type for, for words into which you could drop certain kinds of images, um, and lithography, which was a different thing for posters, for music, uh, and, and so on. So Kerwin had both the music printing business that they were involved in, involved uh, lithographic printing. So they had both kinds of presses and both kinds of skilled workmen. And come the end of the 30s, the music business had hived off. So they had these presses and these workmen, and they needed to feed work to them. Uh, and this, I think, was one reason why the contemporary lithographs were encouraged, uh, because it was going to bring in artists... Uh, and the artist would come back with more work, which very often happened. So at this point, they were making a big thing out of lithography. It was kind of bubbling up anyway because there was this idea that you could have an original print in a book or on your wall, um, and it would not be expensive. So this is a very 1930s art-for-all kind of uh, philosophy. Uh, and... So they, they harnessed this, and this is the origin of what happens next, which is Stanley's story, because uh, come the war, it carried on, but things got more difficult. One of the reasons Kerwin could do this was that they were terribly good to their workforce, treated them very well, and therefore they didn't experience any severe union troubles when they said, well, here's an artist, he's going to come in and draw uh, in your building... Uh, he's not a union member, but will that be all right? Uh, and, you know, they said, yes, that's OK. It's not a threat to us. We, we understand. We like artists, you know. And the artists who went there, you know, had this nice relationship, as far as one can tell, with the um, unionised, apprenticed, lith lithographic men. Um, and it was a, a highly protected, um, skilled industry. Um, and Stanley may have something more to say about uh, the unionisation. This is really part of his story, but because I'm here, I'll tell it very briefly, and uh, you might like to ask questions later. Uh, this is in Wigan, where Stanley comes from, and was uh, a printers and binders where his uncle worked. So this is the beginning of a, uh, a contact with this kind of industry. Um, a lithograph done at the art school in Wigan. Um, and it was something done in art schools, uh, I think partly as an artist's medium, but also because it could be the way into a, uh, a sort of trade uh, career. Uh, and moving onwards, uh, down at the Slade, we're sort of charting Stanley's movements here, coming to London. Um, and... Uh, I've put in a couple of later ones uh, just to sort of keep them together. And there's another one. And what I think needs explaining at this point is uh, a, a shift from 
what I've described going on down in the East End with essentially a sort of industrial plant which has a few artists coming in on the, at the edges and the uh, model that existed in Paris where you had uh, a much more artist-based production unit, small-scale, flexible, um, to serve artists above anything else. Uh, and probably the most famous lithographic uh, printer was Morlo, uh, with whom Picasso worked, apparently because in the winter of 1945, just after the liberation, uh, everybody was freezing, there was no fuel, and Morlo had a, a very large delivery of firewood. I don't know how he got it, but it was a warm place to go and work, so Picasso started doing a lot of lithographs um, over that winter. And being Picasso, he immediately expanded the potential of it, invented new techniques just by experimenting, and sort of gave a bit of a kick to lithography, um, which he hadn't really done before. And off the, off the basis of this, um, many of the other great school of Paris artists started doing it too. Um, Giacometti, uh, Braque, um, uh, Matisse, and, and, and more. And here is Stanley uh, over in Paris, uh, working in this environment, uh, and as far as I can tell, having a great time. Um, <laughs> which meant that he was uh, in line to be headhunted. He'd already helped his tutor, <coughs> Kerry Richards, um, at Slade, because Kerry was trying to do lithographs and hadn't really figured out the technique and things started going wrong. Uh, and Stanley had gone to Paris and now knew how to do it and was one of very few possible people who could have set up one of these sort of French-style um, establishment. So here is a, is a Kerry Richards done once the Kerwin studio had set up and a, a later one there. Uh, and uh, here is a picture of them, or, or Stanley rather, working on a, uh, a Kerry Richards stone. You can see it's on the bed of a, um, a very simple direct press. Uh, and um, Again, this is really part of Stanley's story because I've got the pictures. I'll run through this very briefly. Uh, we've had Kerwin and we've got Stanley, and now the question is, how do they come together? Uh, well, this happened because at Kerwin, they thought we sort of can't go on with artists the way we have, but we don't want to give it up. Uh, the union situation is getting more difficult. Uh, also in... In London, there was the beginning of a, a boom in limited edition prints, which hadn't happened before. So um, there was a sort of opportunity and also a desire to, to shift over to a different kind of production. Um, and Timothy Simon, the son of Oliver Simon, who I mentioned, uh, had gone into the family business and saw this as, a, as an objective. A friend of his... Uh, a gallerist called uh, Robert Irving, a very interesting man, um, also wanted somewhere where his artists could go. Previously, you had to have them done in Paris. It was very complicated and expensive. So, you know, we want somewhere in London that will do this job. And it was Robert Irving who um, headhunted Stanley from Paris, turned up in the courtyard, said, um, come, come and work in East London. <laughs> Uh, he'll tell you the rest of the story. Difficult choice to make. <laughs> yes. But in fact, there was a brief diversion of setting up in St Ives for about six months while the building was got ready in London. So Stanley went down and um, met all these St Ives artists, which was about the sort of, in some ways, the peak of um, creativity there, and, and did prints for them in slightly makeshift circumstances in Four Streets and Ives. But that's a nice sort of prehistory, and particularly, obviously, a Barbara Hepworth uh, connection. So these are some of these early ones. And there is Barbara Hepworth at a, a later stage uh, when she did the Aegean Suite as a, as a sort of follow-up. But this is, is from that early um, first go. So this is her first ever uh, lithograph. And, and this uh, a later one. 
Uh, and some of these you can see on display upstairs, and, and a still later one. And um, I have to say, ha having worked as an artist in the Kerwin studio and experienced Stanley's method and overheard him dealing with other artists, I have to say he is just brilliant uh, and understands exactly when to intervene and suggest and when to... Uh, stand back and let the artist work and the success of this required somebody with this particular skill of uh, keeping everything going, keeping it calm, not closing the door on experiment uh, ever but um, sort of guiding the process because this is very process driven. Uh, you don't do it all at once, you have to go through a whole series of stages and the thing itself grows and it's Typically, it's like all printmaking media, um, it's something you push against. Uh, and it has its own personality, which will sort of push back quite often. And I think, certainly my own limited experience, and I suspect that of other people, is this is rather nice in a way. It's unlike paint, which doesn't push like that. Mm. Um, this has got its own sort of physical characteristics, like, for example, how you would do that background. Um, which is a, a diluted wash. Uh, it requires timing and skill and maybe, well, Stanley can tell us later what's going on there. Uh, another one there, perhaps technically a little simpler there. And so it, the studio set up in London uh, in this little converted stable just across the road from the main print works, but far enough away for the unions not to be an issue. And it actually employed ex-Slade students very largely um, as its workforce. Uh, these are among the early products. And uh, Henry Moore um, came in. He'd done various kinds of print before this, but uh, he liked working with Stanley particularly and, in fact, became his own print publisher so that, you know, he just did them as and when he wanted to. Um, And he particularly liked um, diving under the press. When you print, you have a quite a lot of waster sheets when you're running the press through to get the ink even and that sort of thing. And you throw them under, underneath um, because the thing's running. And Henry would dive under the press uh, and pull them out and take them home because they were sort of nice, interesting um, sheets of paper. And I think one of the interesting features is um, sculptors uh, using this two-dimensional medium um, and, and finding richness in it. And very often, as many of them have said, something that stimulates them to go back into three dimensions. This is fascinating because, I mean, I guess one can, you know, when, you, when you're told this is Henry Moore, you can work it out, but it's not typical. That couldn't be anybody else. Uh, Kenneth Armitage, another sculptor from that time. Lynn Chadwick, again, interestingly, using what must be some of the same plates printed in different colorways. Uh, Elizabeth Frink uh, did quite a lot of work at, at Kerwin, and the, the themes are similar to her sculptures, but she has her own sort of graphic language. Um, but many painters, of course, uh, used the studio. It was an open facility. Anybody... Uh, you know, who was willing to cover the cost, was able to go and work there. Uh, John Piper, who'd been active in the, in the late 30s down in Plasto, he uh, came back and expanded his technique, particularly this remarkable print uh, in a sort of Jackson Pollock um, idiom. But typically, a Piper, there's a place and there's a building. Uh, Terry Frost there... Alan Davy, and I've just got two versions of this because he uh, used this process. As, as you probably know, uh, you have to draw each colour on a separate sheet or stone or zinc plate um, so that you can sort of print some of the colours and then change uh, the nature of the other workings onto it. So this uh, black image here is, is kind of produced in two versions, and this print 
uh, has a number of different variant versions based on the same underlying um, image. Uh, Alan Jones, uh, Harold Co Cohen here using uh, photographic uh, technique, which is something that Stanley pioneered that had just been developed for the industry. So although it is to some extent a sort of backward looking 19th century technique, it's opened itself up to uh, much more modern um, kinds of working. Uh, David Hockney, quite interestingly, sort of took it backwards, if you like, and a lot of artists followed him in being rather in love with the traditional nature of drawing, um, although, again, sort of really it couldn't be any other period. Um, I'm nearly at the end. Uh, the studio moved up from the East End uh, as a result of a merger by the parent company and into what in many ways was a better location, uh, just off Tottenham Court Road, uh, which was where I first encountered it. That's the big um, Ratcliffe Reliable Press at the back, which was getting a bit elderly and rather unreliable, in fact, uh, by the end of its days. But it made a wonderful sort of clunking noise uh, as it worked. You had to have two people staffing it, one at each end, one to feed in the paper and the other to take off the sheets. Mm. And there is <coughs> the workforce, as I, uh, I remember them when I went there. Uh, and it was a lovely working environment. It was all, you know, very nice to be there. Uh, this is getting more modern. Um, Midford Place came to an end. The lease was up in 1989. And the whole thing almost folded at that point because it was very hard to find affordable property in London. And the solution came in moving it to a... Um, Place near Cambridge, Chilford Hall, uh, a very extraordinary setup by a man called Sam Alper, who made his money in caravans and then diversified into vineyards and uh, wedding hospitality and all sorts of other things. Um, but he was an art lover and he had a, a silkscreen printer in place there already. So this sort of made a sensible match for, uh, for Kerwin. So that became the story from the early 90s onwards, and Stanley brilliantly carried on. Uh, so one went there and everything was very much the same, except the Ratcliffe Reliable had gone into retirement. Um, and Paula Rago started working uh, and is probably one of the better known uh, of the artists who has been working there lately. And uh, using stone, using plate, um, it, the medium works extremely well with her, her graphic style. But there's also an upsurge of young, possibly slightly nostalgic artists, such as Mark Hurld, um, here doing a sort of celebratory print for the, the 50th anniversary um, and evoking the, uh, the visual language of the, the interwar and of Edward Borden. Um, and there at work, close up. And Claire Curtis, in a rather similar manner, uh, making this print um, for the gallery here uh, of um, Barbara Hepworth's garden in St Ives, which sort of brings it round full circle. So um, Chilford carries on currently as the uh, print study centre, which Stanley will tell us more about, which is, I think, a very direct line of fulfilment back to the Reverend John Kerwin and, and the idea of teaching and instructing and spreading the joy. Um, the main artist printmaking facility has now moved to London and is um, sharing uh, premises with uh, Coriander Studios uh, sure. in London, which is more accessible, it has to be said, than, than a village um, 10 miles outside Cambridge. So that's the end of the pictures. I'll sit down and shut up and <laughs> it's Stanley's turn. <laughs> Well, you've heard some of the story, and what I'm going to tell you about are rather different aspects of the Kerwin studio. And my beginning, as Alan has indicated, really started when I went down to the Slade at a time when uh, Professor Coldstream was head of fine art. And in those days, printmaking was regarded as a kind of secondary study um, if you didn't get a place 
for painting in the life rooms, then you went and did your secondary study. And it was this that sent me down into the lithography room where I met Kerry Richards. And of course, you've seen some of Kerry's work um, here. But Kerry, being a poetic Welshman, loved doing the things, but he couldn't control them technically. So he and I spent quite a long time investigating the technicalities of lithography. Um, and this took, because I was doing what was called then Slade Diploma, I had to produce paintings and drawings and so on. But at the same time, I wanted to specialise in this strange medium which actually attracted <coughs> painters and sculptors ever since its invention. And as Alan pointed out, one of the reasons for that is that it, it gives the artist a freedom of handling brushes, crayons, any implements that they can use that contain grease. Grease is the factor that actually registers the image on the stone or the plate. And it's this kind of mystery, this alchemy, between making this object and then translating it into a printing form. But the mystery doesn't stop there. It then presents itself for further development. And this is where so many artists have spent such a long time experimenting in lithographic processes because they offer so much from an aesthetic point of view. And of course, once you get into this stage where technicalities begin to be important, then you have to know the answers. And this sent me across to Paris because in this country, you couldn't actually um, spend time either as an apprentice or as a student in printing factories. They wouldn't allow you to do it. But in Paris, it was a different situation. And I was lucky to meet Gérard Patrice, who actually, um, he and I, got on very well in the process of enthusing about printmaking as a creative art form. Now, this I want to explain because what Alan has been describing has been very much a traditional English way of making printed images. Now, in France, again, it was different. You had artists who were making what are called limited edition prints. In other words, the publisher of the work would decide with the artist how and when the artist would go to the studio and join a team, a team of people who knew exactly how the lithography operated and he would become part of that team and work with these craftsmen and this is exactly what Picasso did and this is why um, the system was so attractive to artists because if they did get into trouble the printers were skilled to a degree that they could take over and get the artist out of the trouble. So I spent two two and a half years working with Patrice, learning the craft, the métier, and it actually benefited me. I had to work extremely hard physically because the French proofing presses are not electrified. You have to pull them all by hand and that actually um, tests your sincerity, believe me. And we actually had to work round the clock because we were working in competition with Murlo and the established printers of that time. My relationship with Robert Erskine, this is the publisher who Alan mentioned, had, who had formed a gallery in Cork Street because his, his enthusiasm was for the printed image. And this actually interested me a great deal as a student and he used to come and uh, sell my prints in his gallery. And we had a conversation. He said to me, someday if you go abroad, try and get 
more skilled at the printing end of it because nobody in this country can do this kind of work. There are commercial firms, but this is not really a commercial activity. So I was lucky. I was able to meet Hayter, the engraver. Now you've got upstairs two of Hayter's engravings. He was the man who had a studio in Paris which attracted Americans from New York and from all over Europe to learn how to make printed images by themselves, not with having necessarily a printer. And he and I met and he said to me, Patrice is the man you should learn under if he will accept you. So this is my situation for two and a half years. I was able to do my own work and learn an awful lot. Um, Montparnasse at that time was a rather odd place because you'd had the Hungarian Revolution and you'd had the Algerian problem and the streets were full of French paratroopers. So it was rather like living in an occupied country. But somehow you get used to it and we managed. And one morning, my friend Robert Erskine appeared on the steps of the studio and said to me, I've got a job for you. And I thought he was bringing another artist across to the studio. He said, the Kerwin Press is interested in rejuvenating their relationship with artists. Are you interested in coming to help form this studio? And I said, well, not really. I'm fully ensconced here in Paris. And he said, well, come and talk to them and see if you can help them. So over the Christmas time, I went to Plasto and the conversation was basically that they were wanting to start this venture. Um, and the managing director, Herbert Simon, said, uh, we're willing to try it for two years. Um, if it doesn't work, do you mind going back to Montparnasse? I said, not at all. <laughs> and that's how it was left. So I came and began this studio, but we went to St. Ives, as Alan has indicated, and met, of course, Barbara. Now, Barbara um, had her own determination about doing things, and... The prints, the early prints that she did with me were done in a small studio, very much with experimentation. And this is really what is so different about this kind of work. You're creating something with a group. It's not a commercial activity in that sense, but you have to produce something which A, pleases the artist, and B, satisfies the publisher because the publisher is providing the means to get it marketed. And this is the kind of situation that Kerwin Studio has meant to develop ever since its foundation. There are other aspects of it. One is the intense research that we have done with materials that printmakers use in lithography, because commercial materials, although they are satisfactory, they are not necessarily going to last all that length of time. So we've had to make sure that the paper, the ink, and everything connected with the making of the work is of the finest quality. Because these prints don't remain in drawers, they're in museums and they're valued, signed and numbered by the artist. So you're dealing with a very specialist object and it's this kind of thinking that has to permeate the whole of the production of the work. But at the same time, you have to keep your eye on new developments. And this is one of the things that the studios helped the printmaking world. Um, John Piper, when he was working with me in Tottenham Court Road, where the studio was, wanted to do a retrospect of English churches. Now, this was for a gallery, and basically we decided that we were going to explore and exploit 
his idea of lithography in these 35 prints, these views of churches. And this last print to be done, I suggested to him that we use photolithography. Now we're talking now about uh, the year 1966, 67. Now photography in those years was absolutely anathema to galleries. They thought it was a purely commercial activity. And no artist using photography in printmaking uh, would expect the work to be acceptable. So I said to John, it's high time that this process was given proper appreciation. So this print we did of a, a Baptist church in Wales actually was part of his series. And luckily at the time, the pop art movement had become well known in the West End. So photography came at the right time to be combined with auto lithographic drawing. And this is the kind of development that the studio has used to help the imaginations of artists to free up their approach to printmaking. And this is an important element of the Kerwin, that the experimentation and the ability to broaden their own quality of work has been offered by this particular printmaking studio. And that, I think, is my main point, that it's not basically something where reproductions are made. It's for creativity. And, of course, following on from that, we've got a situation with the printmaking study centre where people can come, it has its own basic staff who are trained to handle young people from the age of eight upwards. They come in classes and they're allowed to work on printing machines to discover what this kind of work can offer them. And it's so successful that it's booked up from year to year solidly. And it's not only young people, it's people who are in retirement, artists who come, and everybody who tries to make work by lithography, etching, screen printing, in this case, they can experiment and get an expression of some inner feeling that has been dormant for a long time. So its intention, not a commercial setup, it's a charity, but it is a highly successful concept, preserving a lot of the elements that otherwise with digital printing, which is now taught in art schools, <coughs> has covered over and art students can now come and make reference to these more traditional but equally vibrant ways of working. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I wanted to ask Stanley a question specifically, um, sort of going on from his uh, mention of photo lithography. And um, at the Cohen studio, um, do you have the technique where you can um, you, you, you use photo lithography with acetate? So that, for instance, if you have an artist who's sketching from a sketchbook and wants to retain the spontaneity of that fresh sketch, they can transfer that straight from their sketchbook and they sort of preserve that lovely graphic line? Uh, yes, is the answer to your question. Um, what has happened in the printing industry is that aluminium plate is now the major source of printing machinery for lithographic printing. And what we can do with it now is to combine autographic work, which is hand-drawn obviously, with photo imagery so that artists who want to use that combination 
can now make printed forms from it. It used to be a very difficult task in the days when uh, all the work was done on deep edge aluminium. That was purely a photographic commercial operation. But this methodology that we have now, what we call a photopolymer plate, gives freedom for the artist to work, providing the, the drawing material contains black pigmentation. You can see it as it appears on the uh, sheet. And he or she can control it and make all sorts of alterations. So it is now a much freer way of working even than on lithographic stone. We still work on lithographic stone because it has its own um, contribution even today to make. And it's still very popular with artists, but it has its own technical difficulties. But um, no, photolithography has now made a permanent impact on creative artists' work. No doubt about that. Well, I've got a question for you, Stanley. Um, I was just wondering if you could talk some more um, about when you were living in St. Ives with Barbara Hepworth for a summer. Um, so I believe you moved down there with your wife and children. For, That's right. And um, if you could just speak sort of anecdotally about what it was like to know Barbara Hepworth and um, to work with her professionally. That would be fantastic. Well, I can tell you a little about her. I had the interesting experience of working with her first in 1958. She was part of this group that Robert Erskine commissioned. And she and I got on, well, one has to do this, you've got to get on very well with teaching people how the process operates. And you've got to do that without blinding them with science, you see, because artists are used to working with sketchbooks, notebooks, canvases and whatever. Now, with lithography, you have to have a certain sense of uh, understanding as the artist to do the work. Um, and this is what this project was partially about. But what, what she liked to do was to do things on her own terms. Now, if you can imagine that you, you've got a process which doesn't like interference, really. And Barbara, I gave a, a large sheet of prepared plate for her to work on. So she said, can I take this home? And I said, yes, if you want. Not thinking that when she returned with the work that she'd drawn on this plate, she'd actually polished all the surface off the sheet of zinc. It had no grain on it whatsoever. And I took a deep breath and I thought, how on earth am I going to get this <laughs> chemically to do anything? I don't want to discourage her. And the, this is what happened. Um, I went round to the local chemist in Fourth Street and I said, uh, have you got acetic acid and citric acid? And I went out through the whole list of chemicals. And he wondered what on earth I was doing, but I didn't tell him. <laughs> and I spent about a week, Barbara kept phoning me up and saying, can I come and see what I've done? I said, no, it's not right. Finally, I managed to print it and I showed it to her and she was delighted with it, luckily. But basically, she still didn't understand what she'd done. So we spent the next month or so, she visiting and asking questions. And finally, she did that image, plus another one, which we hadn't seen, for Robert Erskine. But she put her whole mind on it. And I was very impressed by the sense of dedication that she had in doing this kind of work. And later, when I went down to do a special series of prints with her, um, organised by Marcus Brumwell, her friend, and also uh, Herbert Simon, who was head of the Kerwin Press. 
I stayed and that I was on hand at all hours of the day because she had a habit of getting up in the morning at about two o'clock and coming knocking on my door and saying, Stanley, I've had an idea. Can you come and have a look at it? So I had to walk through St. Ives in my slippers <laughs> to her, her basic uh, shed where she was drawing these uh, plates as they were. But often I had to help her redo these things because she had a habit of picking up the wrong substance. And of course this is terrible when uh, you have it on the plate there as an idea and you know that it's not going to print because of the misuse of chemistry. But luckily, and it is luck, she got the idea finally of how these images operate. And from then on she produced these very good separate sets of prints for the Kerwin Press and you'll see some of them upstairs. They really are remarkably done with the confidence that she did with constant practice. And that's her, um, I have great respect for her. And Henry Moore, Henry Moore I, really was the first artist to come to the studio. And I worked with him until he died because he discovered that graphic work can offer other qualities other than drawing, it can offer printing situations which cannot be obtained any other way. And if you go to the Henry Moore Foundation at Much Haddam, you'll see the catalogues of books they are really, of all the images that he and I did um, <coughs> over the years. He started in uh, 1959 and we went on until Sadly, he died in the 80s. Uh, it's a, a compendium, a life's work spent discovering what lithography can offer to a sculptor. And he's unique, I think, in the sense that he continued with this as his own publisher and could experiment on his own terms. He wasn't interested, finally, in whether the prints sold or not. These were ideas that actually formed a basis for his sculpture. So from copying out of a sketchbook, his ideas developed throughout his life. And I think this is the correct way of looking at a printing medium, if you can. Hi, this is a question um, for Stanley. Um, apart from life graphy, um, what other techniques would you say were most sought after? Well, with printing, you see, there are in lithography, there are two different kinds. One is direct, where the image is actually inked and the paper put on top and passed through the press. And that's how you print etchings and so on. But with offset printing, you have a system where the artist can draw compositionally the correct way around. It's a great help. They can actually see on the plate what they are actually going to see on the printed paper. And this was a, a method invented by an American, um, Ira Rubel, in about 1912. And Harold Kerwin introduced it to his printing company at, in about 1914. And one of the machines that we had in the studio was one of the early models of that kind of printing. But it's great to have it because where you have direct printing, you have one attempt at the image and you take the impression. Now with offset printing, you can see the image, you can see the printing paper, and you can see the image imprinted from the plate to the paper. Now that means you can do all sorts of other things as well. You can alter the color. You can alter the impression on the machine, so the image changes. And these are factors that intrigue artists a great deal because they can judge more accurately 
the kind of results they're likely to get. But I must say this, a lot depends on the skill of the team in the studio. They have to be dedicated to the work. And it's difficult work because it requires getting on with the artists all the time, people of different temperaments, whatever. And actually, you do find people who are willing to do that but the few and far between. <laughs> uh, I might just add something there, if I dare mention the word silkscreen. Because historically speaking, I, I, I said there were um, you know, four major things, and I didn't get around to talking about that one, because that's the one that comes last in sequence. Mm. And I guess it was about ten years or so after you set up the studio that did become uh, a, a major factor in the print publishing um, business. And uh, it is in many ways easier to set up and less technically skilled. Uh, and there were very good artist printers like Chris Prater, for example, mm. who gave the same sort of services to artists like John Piper, who turned over to doing silkscreen rather more. Mm. Um, and uh, I expect many of you have done it yourselves, probably more, more than have had a chance at lithography, which you know you don't come by so readily, uh, and uh, you know it's still very current in in the field. True. <laughs> yes. To, to that end, I was wondering also about your relationships with those other studios, like Cult Pro, with Chris Prater, Edition Electo. Um, you were obviously working in a very specific field, but what, was there any kind of sense of um, a kind of collaboration on a wider scale in terms of enabling artists to get their work into print and to get it recognised more widely? Uh, yes, I mean, again, collaboration does occur. Um, it means that you have to have complete communication to do it which is uh, sometimes difficult if you've got an artist who's doing other things with another printer. So it's better from a concentration point of view if you can find whatever you're doing to the person who's running the studio because immediate results can come from that. But there's no doubt it is possible to combine different processes and you find this a lot in the School of Paris prints, where artists like Braque and Jacques Villon have actually made an image together. It's not one more than another. It's a combined operation. But you don't often get that in this country. But this is the kind of uh, experimentation which artists like to try. Um, we once did a book with Henry Moore um, to do with the poetry of Auden. And part of, now this is a true story actually, it was in the early days when we were making experimentation with what I call continuous tone printing, which is a photographic process. But the plates were actually able to be hand-drawn as well. And this is the technology we were using for Henry's book. And the publisher, who shall be nameless, said to me, I, you do the proofing and I'm going to let the Swiss company do the editioning. I said, look, these plates are new. I don't know how they're going to perform on their machines. He said, oh, don't worry, uh, I'll see to it. And I thought, well, good luck. <laughs> About a fortnight, three weeks later, I get an anxious telephone call from Bob. These plates, they don't want to print them. They can't print them. What do I do? I said, well, I did warn you. I said, you'll have to bring them all back and we'll have to print them here. So this is what happened. All, the, all that work brought back and we, it took us another four or five months to complete the book. The publishing date had to be postponed and everything. 
But that is the kind of technical thing that can stop something happening like that. And I mention it just because often when it does work, it works very well. Collaboration can be a very constructive thing. There we are. Are there any more questions? I, I just wanted to know um, what the impact of working with all these other artists had on your own practice, and if you still make prints today. Sorry, can, can you show it up? I can't Do you need you. me to say it again? Yes. Uh, what the impact of working with all these other artists had on your own practice as a printmaker, and if you're still making prints today? Yes, is, again, is the answer to that. Um, it's interesting because, in a way, um, when you're working in a place like the Cohen Studio, you're dealing with a vast range of people and styles and so on. And you have to develop a faculty for cutting off when you want to do your own work, ideally clearing the studio out of people and this is what Hayter said to me, and he did the same thing, and work at weekends or late at night, and that's the way to do it. But it is possible, and you put, uh, you put what the phrase says, you put blinkers on, and don't look at anybody else's work, just get on with it. But you have to persuade your assistants to do the same thing, <laughs> and that's not easy. Is there another question over here? Thank you. Um, I'm not sure who I should aim this at, really. It's about legacy. Um, there's been a, a reduction in recent years of uh, printmaking in art schools. Yes. And conversely, <coughs> there's also been a resurgence of small print studios nationally, which is mm. you know, a delight for many of us. Um, so, in many ways, the sort of skill base for young artists, artists who enjoy printmaking has, uh, those opportunities have been reduced. Um, I'd like to know, really, I guess from both of you, where you sort of see the development of fine art printmaking going in the future. Well, Sorry. I think Stanley knows <laughs> much more about this than I do, yeah. but uh, I'm, I didn't go to art school. I came into printmaking sort of from the outside uh, and uh, had a very nice time so um, you know it's always open to to this kind of thing it's slightly like life drawing I think which many art schools don't do much of but it's out there and lots of other people are doing it mm. so it's an odd situation certainly where you know the the kind of monolith is being broken down into separate uh, little islands uh, or fragments, all of which, you know, serve rather well in a way. Mm. You know, you don't want hundreds of people in a life room. You know, 20 people's enough. So it can happen in the evening, you know, in any room that's the right size. Mm. Printmaking is a bit more complicated. It's a bit more that's kind right. of intensive of equipment and so on. But as, as you say, uh, you know, it, it is happening. Can, can I tell you what happened in my case? You see, I taught... <coughs> I taught lithography part-time at the Slade for about 40 years. And when I retired, um, the owner of the estate on which the studio stands um, said to me, what are, you, what are you doing with your time now? And I said, well, apart from the Kerwin studio, I said, I've got an idea that printmaking at the Slade is going to be diminished. Now this was a great pity because we had a postgraduate two-year course which was worldwide popular, it's packed. But this was the decision they were going to make uh, because for some reason they said it was too expensive uh, in student numbers. In other words, if you had a large room with four students all working at machines, that wouldn't pass muster. And this was the argument that they put forward. 
So I said to Mr. Alper, look, what is going to happen if this happens at the Slade? It will be reflected over all art schools. And in fact, this is what happened. Um, computer machines were moved in because they were given to them. And a few, I think two or three of the original printing presses that we had were put down in a basement. And the course didn't exist anymore. I said to Mr. Alper, look, if you've got spare space, can we have a centre where people can come who want to know how to make an etching or who want to do a lithograph or a wood engraving purely for their own satisfaction? Have, have you got the ability to provide that? And he said, well, I'll try. So we found at the back of our <coughs> own studio uh, a garage which had tractors in it. So they were taken out. And this is the year 2000. And we s sort of pleaded with various companies to give us their old machines. And the machines we've got were the ones that actually we began with. So you've got Albion presses, you've got Columbia presses, you've got etching presses, lithographic presses, and you've got a special staff that actually wants to convey information and practice, not only to um, people like yourself, but also to young people, people who would benefit from making a choice whether they make work on a computer or whether they want to draw it by hand. And if they need that information, they can come to the studio and get it. And luckily, I brought some um, pamphlets. You can have a look at one if you like, take it away. This, this is so successful because people are anxious to know and practice these background ways of working which you can't get in art schools. Now, there isn't a staff that can instruct this kind of technology. But we've managed to establish this system of keeping these traditions in operation. I think on that's a really good note to on which to, to end. Um, please join me in thanking both Alan Powers and Stanley Jones. It's been a really fantastic um, opportunity to benefit from your expertise and knowledge and also to get a little insight into how those very experimental prints of Barbara Hepworth <laughs> upstairs came into being more yes. by accident than design. Yes. But thank you so much.